Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Alden Library. I'm Scott Seaman, Dean of Libraries, and it's my privilege uh, this afternoon to introduce our first authors at Alden for this semester. Um, our program today offers a unique insight into World War I through Edmund Blunden's 1928 memoir, Undertoned Undertones of War. John Greening, our speaker, has edited a new edition of that book. And the Times Literary Supplement called Mr. Greening's new edition, quote, an invaluable contribution to our knowledge of both the poet, that is Blunden, and the war that he so miraculously survived to say nothing of our understanding of the poetry it produced. Mr. Greening is a poet, a critic, and an editor. He's also spent much of his life teaching adults and young people in Scotland, England, and the United States. He's been a reviewer of poetry for the Times Literary Supplement for 20 years. And as a poet, he's internationally recognized and has won numerous literary awards. Our interviewer today is Nicole Richards. Reynolds, excuse me. <laughs> Nicole is an associate, Nicole Reynolds is an associate professor of English and women's gender and sexuality studies here at Ohio University. Uh, she's published on the relationship between romantic period literature and architecture, as well as on uh, romanticism and suicide. Her recent scholarship focuses on Edmund Blunden and the British print culture between World War I and World War II. So please join me in welcoming our speakers today. Excellent. So before I um, ask John some questions, I wanted to say my own thank yous to all of the folks here at Alden Library who um, have been so responsive and receptive um, in the last uh, couple of years, even as we've been planning this event. But um, there are lots of folks I've had contact with and, and others behind the scenes. But um, some folks are sitting here today. I wanted to thank Kelly Broughton and uh, Deb, Debbie Daniels and uh, Jen Harvey. Um, Miriam Intratour, the special collections librarian, um, should probably run in the opposite direction when she sees me coming these days because I always have lots and lots of ideas about how she should spend her time. And uh, so um, I'll make a plug for an exhibit that we've co-curated upstairs on the fifth floor um, that draws from Edmund Blunden's collection and, and focuses on, on his experience of the war. Um, and I wanted to thank other people involved with the exhibit. Um, Miriam Nelson helped install it. Um, Carmen Beecroft and Janet Carlton did uh, digitization for the exhibit. So a uh, wonderful effort all the way around from the library, and thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to thank the departments on campus, the units on campus that contributed to this Authors at Alden um, event, and that would include the English Department, um, the Honors Tutorial College, the History Department, the Contemporary History Institute, and the War and Peace theme. So very generously, um, this event plugs into lots of different activities units across campus and they they donated so thank you um, so I wanted John uh, <laughs> your turn I <laughs> uh, wanted to thank John Greening for coming all the way from England um, and for just being so receptive to my emails my earliest emails back in 2016 is when we started talking about this and, and um, so very generously giving of his time um, so to to talk to us, John, about the importance, just generally first, right, of poetry to the First World War, to Britain's experience of the First mm. World War, and how that had happened, and then um, to put to put Blunden in that context Indeed. for us. Yes, thank you. It's lo yes. lovely to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, Ted Hughes, you may know Ted Hughes, the poet, who's married to Sylvia Plath. He called um, the First World War our national ghost, which I think. Mm nails it, really. It's something that the poets of the First World War, every school child knows. That somehow they, we all get presented with the poets of the First World War in high school. Um, and they are very special. They, they do haunt us. Um, and why that should be is a, is a bit of a mystery, but it's 
to do with truth-telling, I think. It's to, to do with the, the point at which they emerged. These were mainly pastoral poets, really, who expected to go on writing pastoral poetry, looking back to Keats and Shelley, uh, Tennyson. And then suddenly they found themselves in a war which was in the most beautiful of settings very often, because a lot of the First World War, the Western Front was in, in where people, where, where the English went on their holidays, to be honest, the Somme and so on. It was a holiday zone. Um, and beautiful landscapes, but how can you write about it when it's being torn apart before your eyes? So that presented a stylistic challenge to many of them. Some of the poets just went on writing the same way, but the best of the poets it did something to their work. And we'll be talking about that later, I'm sure, but certainly in the case of Blunden, you feel the tension within his poetry, mm. almost as if it, it, it wants to break apart into modernism, I suppose. He wasn't a modernist poet, but the, there's something in, certainly in undertones, which we'll be talking about, which you could say uh, um, treads the same path. He read uh, Ulysses while he was writing it, instead it, uh, one of his Japanese students gave him the first edition of, of Ulysses. Good to say, well, that was worth. Um, and I think that may be an influence. But uh, yes, it, it haunts us, I suppose, in a sentence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how, how does sort of London's work fit into the canon of the First World War writers? He is quite a difficult poet on the face of it. He writes very elaborately. I'm, I'm talking about him as a poet at the moment. I, and I know what we have up here is Undertones, which is a prose memoir, but he uh, added an appendix of 31, later 32 poems. Um, and it was as a poet that he was known when that came out. And it's as a poet, he, consider, or he was thought of himself chiefly as a poet. So he was a very elaborate poet, and he wrote in what appears at first a very archaic style. Uh, but he is writing war poetry, and he finds a new voice. I mean, the po just, just to put him in context, the, the, the poets that we know, and probably many of them are not very familiar here. Um, we know Wilfred Owen. He's perhaps the most famous, and Siegfried Sassoon. Owen, very Keatsian, very rich, very lush, and devastatingly moving, but very lofty in tone. Sassoon, satirical, down to earth, uses rhyme in very, in very sharp, jabbing ways, uh, very bitter, very angry man. He, he received the military cross, but he flung it into the River Mersey, uh, little knowing how significant the Mersey would become later culturally. Uh, he flung it into the Mersey in protest. Uh, figures also like Edward Thomas. Now, Edward Thomas was Robert Frost's best friend. I'm not how many, sure how many close friends Robert Frost had, but he, he himself said that Edward Thomas was the best friend he ever had. Edward Thomas uh, is perhaps the war poet who's influenced contemporary poets in England, in Britain maybe, more than the, the, the most of all. Uh, his style uh, fed into so much of contemporary poetry. Um, and there are others like Rosenberg and David Jones and women who, who have emerged, like Mary Borden from Chicago, a very fine poet, but she lived in Britain, but she's American essentially. But Blunden, this book has um, always been there. It's never been out of print since 1928. But the poetry, the war poetry, though pretty popular, hasn't really influenced later writers so much. Uh, but caviar, perhaps caviar to the general, but uh, undertones of war is a different, different matter. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little bit about London's background about sort of where uh, he comes from and uh, what, what brought him to, to the war, what was his sort of, you know, take on, on this new adventure as such a young man? He was born in, uh, actually was born in Tottenham Court Road, right in the center of London. I think there's a Japanese restaurant there now, appropriately, because he lived in Japan for quite a while. Um, but he was a country lad because he spent his childhood in a place called Yalding in Kent, and it was an idyll. And he was blissfully happy there. The countryside and cricket and books. They were the three things that mattered to him the most um, in that childhood. He's always harping back to that, that place, Yalding. 
uh, that, that idyllic childhood. It comes back, back to that again and again in his poetry. Um, but he went to school. He went to school there for, for some time, but he went to Christ's Hospital in Horsham. Christ's Hospital is a very remarkable school, still going, and they, I, I've got a photograph of him in his uniform somewhere, I believe, if my, there he is, um, called Blue Coats. I think it's a Tudor costume they wore. And uh, that school was previously attended by Coleridge, by Charles Lamb, uh, Lee Hunt, and various other literary figures, later Keith Douglas, the Second World War poet. The school mattered so much to, to Blunden. And you were, were called an old blue if you'd been to Christ Hospital. And very often, Blunden would bump into an old blue on the battlefield. And uh, there was one occasion where he met up with four previous uh, uh, school fellows, and they all had a day out in St. Omer, what he called the Feast of Five. Um, and these were intensely blissful moments for him. Um, and that sense of a band of brothers, which it was a boys' school, there are gir girls go to it now, um, is something that, that runs through his, his, his work. You get it with his loyalty to the battalion in Undertones of War. Uh, incidentally, that wonderful TV series, there are all kinds of parallels with Undertones of War in that, that uh, Band of Brothers TV series, um, which we could perhaps get on to later. <laughs> So, I mean, his, his wartime description, um, he talks a lot about his extraordinary luck, right? That Blunden mm -hmm. was one of the, he was the, he had the longest experience, right, of the British war poets, mm -hmm. uh, served for the longest amount of time mm -hmm. on the front. Yeah. Uh, very sort of disparagingly would say, well, it's because I was so small, you know, that they could sort of shrink yeah. down and, and people wouldn't, um, they wouldn't hit him, right? They wouldn't find him. But he was awarded a medal, right, for bravery and, and uh, so there are these moments, and I've, I've talked about this with, with my students, of this sort of beautiful, as you've mentioned, pastoral kind of description mm -hmm. juxtaposed with that, that violence right. of the, of yeah. the war. Um, and then these lyrical interludes with his old blue That's um, right. friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, per perhaps I'll just read, there's a little description of, of the day he enlisted. Mm -hmm. um, he, went, he joined up when he was 18, straight from school. He was supposed to be going to Oxford. Uh, but uh, they, he deferred his place, and he went to Oxford after the war, but was never really happy there. Uh, and everybody else was joining up. In fact, by the time he got to the, the front, uh, it was halfway through the war, and quite a few of the famous war poets like Rupert Brooke, Charles Sawley, were dead already. This is a little description of um, the, the day he enlisted. <coughs> this is not actually from Undertones. It's one of his many, many, many essays. On a glorious day that August, I got out my bicycle for a longish ride across our county to Chichester, where the renowned Royal Sussex Regiment had its headquarters. I was equipped with papers which were to support my application for His Majesty's commission. And however dusty I was on arrival, the guard received me in the dignified way of an ancient regiment. A less bellicose place could hardly be imagined and there seemed hardly any soldiers in it, but one was deputed to lead me to the major in charge of the barracks that day. He, too, put me at my ease at once, and I began to think the war was remarkably friendly after all. He told me to go over to the sergeant major and get him to run a tape measure around my chest and then come back for a drink and lunch. What promotion! The sequel, perhaps, a fortnight after, was my receiving a commission and the outfit allowance. Fifty pounds in that period was liberal. It easily covered the price, incidentally, of a sword. A little, little introduction to his, uh, to his war career. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a, a willing soldier. The first line of undertones is, uh, I was not anxious to go. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the things that, that gives undertones of war uh, its special importance. This sort of skeptical, qu it's quiet skepticism, really, quiet irony. It's not called undertones for nothing. Uh, he wrote a, po a poem, a later poem, called Values, where he talks about um, the importance of answered undertones, not the big, loud, uh, boastful, rhetorical way of writing, but the quiet perception of what's going on beneath the surface. He's good at that. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's a long-term effect of the war mm. on London, right? So, um, and, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about, so he comes to writing undertones of war um, in, well, he starts composing and writing in the early 1920s, doesn't publish it until 28. Um, so there is a sense of a kind of ever a kind of delayed or deferred response to the war. Um, I mean, how would you say it affects his work, you know, through the rest of his career? It's absolutely central. Yeah. I, it, you could say everything he wrote has elements of the war in it. Um, he, he did write during the war. Not many of the poems he wrote actually during the war survive, but some do, and some are in, in un included in undertones. But he came back to the war again and again. And he did actually write an early version of Undertones called De Bello Germanico, um, which is a sort of mu much more a young man's piece of writing. There's a copy of it on display in the wonderful, wonderful exhibition here. Really do have a look at that if you haven't. Um, his, his brother was setting up a little private printing company, and as a favor to his brother, he offered him this manuscript written just at the end of the war his brother then printed. It's a rather, he, he was embarrassed by it later because it was rather jaunty. Um, there's certainly humor in undertones, but uh, De Bello, I think, strikes a slightly callow tone, really. Um, so that was his, an early response. But then he, he, he mulled it over. He, he had severe uh, depression as a result of it. Um, there were problems at home. His, his marriage was falling apart. He ended up going to Japan to um, become professor at Tokyo University, Imperial University, um, and there it was that he started writing this extraordinary memoir. Everybody was doing it. Everybody was writing memoirs, many of which have just vanished into oblivion. Uh, 1928, when it came out, was um, a particularly uh, rich year for memoirs. But your question was about how it affected him. Yeah. There's a poem that might give an example of that. On the, yes, that was the Feast of Fire, the friends from school I was talking about there. But this poem, uh, The Midnight Skaters. Now, you wouldn't have thought a poem, popular in school anthologies, actually, this one, you wouldn't have thought a poem about skating on a pond in Kent could be anything to do with the war. And yet, uh, if you sort of think about it, uh, let me read it to you and... Look at the, the words such as parapet there, for example, and engines. This is the language of war. Uh, so if I can find it in my edition, I can read it. I could read it off the screen, of course, wouldn't I? But I'm going to be stubborn. And this was first published in a book called Masks of Time, and I just saw a copy of that in the, in the collection uh, here, uh, which I'd, I'd never seen before. So that was a delight. The Midnight Skaters. The hot poles stand in cones. The icy pond lurks under. The pole tops steeple to the thrones of stars sound gulfs of wonder. But not the tallest there, tis said, could fathom to this pond's black bed. Then is not death at watch within those secret waters? What wants he but to catch Earth's heedless sons and daughters? With but a crystal parapet between, he has his engines set. Then on, Blood shouts, on, on, twirl, wheel, and whip above him. Dance on this ball floor, thin and wan. Use him as though you love him. Court him, elude him, reel and pass, and let him hate you through the glass deft use of rhyme there. This is in Blunden's own handwriting. They had a writing master at Christ Hospital. Perfect copper plate handwriting. And even those military reports written during bombardment are often immaculately written. Um, very useful for any scholar approaching his work. Mm -hmm. um, it was a terrific poem, that, but uh, uh, an anthology piece, that. But it's a good illustration of how the pastoral imagery and ostensibly a description of the British countryside becomes infused with this sort of this tension and this undertone of, of, of sort of violence that's lurking. And I think in this way, I think London 
I, I think in part his reputation has been somewhat overshadowed by this, by this idea that he was a Georgian poet or pastoral or of the British countryside. And, and, and uh, I think that a closer look, you know, reveals um, something sort of very disturbing, always just underneath the ice, right, like that. Yeah. Yes, that even F.R. Leavis called him, right. you know, the only G Georgian worth, worth reading. Right. Right. F.R. Leavis oh, was Oh, the poor Georgian. That's quite something. Yes. Um, how did you come to edit Undertones of War? Wow. Well, yeah. uh, uh, no one was more surprised than me. Right. Um, I had published a, a critical guide, a sort of book for the common reader, I suppose, about the poets of the First World War. I was thinking really of students and uh, anyone with a general interest in the war. So it wasn't a, a very loftily toned book at all, but just a general guide to the poets. I particularly enjoyed writing the chapter on Edmund Blundham because I felt he'd he not had his due, um, and because there was that sense that I was bringing the public, to, uh, making the public aware of him. That's something Blunder himself always liked to do, and that's something we have to talk about, was mm -hmm. re remind people that other poets are out there that we should be reading. So I enjoyed writing the, the chapter on Blunder. Uh, and I did one or two other World War-related things. I produced, a, I did a student production of What a Lovely War, for example. And I wrote a sequence of poems to the war poets, so some verse letters. But then one day I got an email from someone called Margie Blunden, who is the daughter of uh, Edmund Blunden uh, in his third marriage. And she'd, I don't know how, she'd come across this book uh, and read the chapter on her father and particularly liked it. It was very complimentary. And her father had always wanted to bring out an expanded illustrated edition uh, and he had what he called his minute book um, in the, uh, the the archive of the, what was in Margie's house uh, and various other folders of work that he'd always wanted to incorporate into an edition of blunt uh, of undertones which had been in print since 1928 and only ever really the the same text in the same format again and again so Margie th thought I might be the person to do this so a publisher was, was involved. I, I visited her in her home in Norfolk, which is quite near where we live, luckily, uh, where she had all this extraordinary material, um, much of which is now in the Harry Ransom Centre, actually. Uh, lucky for me, it didn't go off there uh, before then. And we browsed through and talked about what, what we could do with this. Uh, and I was quite keen. There were several things I wanted to do. I wanted to, to add a many of his essays and introductions and annotations, I wanted to add his 1917 diary, a few months of diary, which had never appeared in print before. And I wanted to give a more representative sample of poetry. He added those, he had those 31, 32 poems at the end of the book. But that was 1928. He lived till 1974 and was writing about the war. So I thought, well, let's have another appendix of another 32 poems written since then, including some of his best poems, including things like Midnight Skaters, uh, to show readers what else he'd, he'd done. So all those elements are incorporated into it, and the illustrations, um, and lots of other material. I had no idea what I was taking on. I'd never done anything like that before. Mm. Uh, probably the worst thing was the index. If anyone ever says to you, <laughs> all the scholars out there, do you want to do the index on your own, or do you want a professional to do it? Do not say, I'll do it myself, <laughs> because an index is, uh, uh, well, a serpent-like thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it occurs to me, it's occurred to me um, that your career is sort of remarkably like London's, in the, to the extent that you're a poet and, and such an active literary reviewer. Mm -hmm. um, we were just talking earlier today about, you know, London's got somewhere in the ballpark of 3,000 plus, you know, reviews and essays and, and periodicals. So that idea of a kind of, of a, of a, of a poet teacher, of a, of a public kind of scholar, mm -hmm. right? And, and, um, and, and taking poetry and, and trying to raise interest, right? And, and circulate poetry much more broadly than the, just the classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, he did, yeah. I mean, the, the bibliography of Blunder's work is 700 pages. Yeah. And all, I mean, I, I put some in my suitcase when I kept looking on that, for example, little volume like that, English Villages. Uh, the kind of thing he, someone would say, you know, can you write us a book in English Villages? And he'd probably write that in an afternoon. Um, when, when he edited Ivor Gurney, um, Gerald Finzi, the composer, uh, who was particularly 
in involved in the editing of Gurney's work, sat him down in a locked room, I think, and uh, he just wrote the introduction for the, for, the, uh, for the Gurney as it stood, like Shakespeare, you know, never, never blotting a, a line. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so he produced an enormous amount. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so what was the question? I can't remember that. <laughs> it was more an observation. Yes, I thought right. that, that that combination of, of a poet and a scholar and a literary mm. reviewer and, and being that active and, uh, and seeing, I think, the role of, of a poet in, in yeah. maybe a more, in a more public uh, way. Uh, in some ways, I get the sense with Blunden in a very kind of pragmatic way. Uh, he had to make a living, right? He left Oxford to support his family because he has to make a living, and so this is what brings him to reviewing and to taking yeah. all these commissions and so forth. By and John Clare, who we need right. to mention. Um, oh, mm -hmm. he, he and Alan Porter, who was a university friend, heard rumors that there were some John Clare manuscripts around. Now, John Clare wasn't really known much by the 1920s. He had had his time in, in, in his own lifetime, but people just wrote him off as a peasant poet. You see, John Clare, who has deeply influenced people like Heaney and Walcott and goodness knows what else, who else. Um, so he took himself off to Peterborough, which is very near where I live, to the museum, which is now much as it was when he went there. And the archivist there, he just said, oh, yeah, the cupboard over there, there's some stuff in there. Open this cupboard, and his papers fell out. And they were all manuscripts of John Clare poems that no one ever done anything with. So Clare proceeded to, to work on these and brought out the first proper um, edition of John Clare. Uh, and that really made his name um, as, a, as a literary scholar. At the same time, he was bringing out his own poetry. This is what I mean about sort of being selfless and devoting yourself to other writers, and uh, something he was so good at. And he did the same with Ivor Gurney, as I've suggested, who was a, a poet you probably don't know over here, but I think you're going to hear more about Ivor Gurney, because there's a big three-volume edition of his work coming out uh, from Oxford soon. He was a composer as well as a, as a poet, um, who uh, survived the war, but when, you know, was in an asylum. Blunder was always very sensitive and sympathetic to troubled individuals, to troubled people, John Clare, you know, people called Claire Mad, poor Mad, Claire Gurney, Christopher Smart. He edited Christopher Smart, who was uh, the Joyce in the Land. You may know from Benjamin Britten's work. Um, and this particularly attracted him. But, but Blunden devoted his life to poetry, other people's poetry, mm -hmm. as well as his own. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very selfless. Mm -hmm. Would you mind reading Claire's Ghost? Claire's Ghost. I, I will happily Claire's read. Claire's Ghost. So you know, the, the, 18th, the 19th century British poet through whom, you know, Blunden channels, channels the war. And, and Clare's Ghost is another example of this sort of pastoral British landscape. Um, and, and he imagines the specter of this poet, John Clare. And it's, again, that use of, of language, of mm. martial language, multitudes of sparks. And um, please. You I'm particularly yeah. glad you asked me that because yeah. we didn't talk about this before and no, I actually brought this with me. This, <laughs> this is, I think it's a first edition. I brought this and put it in my suitcase. The first edition, the 1920, The Wagner. So I'm actually reading from that very book, uh, which gives me a bit of a thrill, really. Uh, <laughs> sad person that I am. Yeah, but this um, <coughs> is the, his first wife. And it seems appropriate to go with Claire because she was a blacksmith's daughter. She was very much a sort of country girl and... Clare, of course, was the ultimate poet of the, of the countryside, similar sort of countryside. He was in Northamptonshire. This is in, in Suffolk where they lived. Uh, so there he is. So that can be in the background when I read Clare's Ghost. Clare's Ghost is one of the few poems he actually wrote at the front. It survived the mud of Passchendaele. Uh, but, but the setting uh, is perhaps more English. He, it's about a ghost. He was very superstitious about these things. He actually... When he was doing that work on Claire's papers, he was, felt he was haunted by Claire. And this happened several times when he, was, when he visited Shelley's uh, house. Similarly, there was a figure that chased him and his wife through the garden. They looked back and there was no, nobody there. He was convinced it was Shelley. And various, various other things. Uh, Undertones is full of spooky characters that drift in and out. So it's, you know, it's one of those um, aspects of, of the war that's not talked about much, the, the spirit side. Um, Spiritualism is very you know, active during the war. Claire's ghost. Pitch dark night shuts in 
and the rising gale is full of a presage of rain. And there comes a withered wail from the wainscot and jarring pain, and a long funeral surge like a wood god dirge, like the wash of the shoreward tides from the firs on a crest. The shaking hedges blacken, the last gold flag lowers from the west. The advent bell moans wild like a witch hag in the storm's unrest. And the lich gate lantern's candle weaves a shroud, and the unlatched gate shrieks loud. Up fly the smithy sparks, but are baffled from soaring by the pelting scurry. And ever, as puff the bellows, a multitude more outpouring die foiled in the endeavor. And a stranger stands with me here in the glow, chinked to the door, and marks the sparks perish in the whirlpool wind. And if I go to the delta of Cyprus, where the glee gate cries, I see him there with his streaming hair and his eyes piercing beyond our human firmament, lit with a burning, deathless discontent. That's remarkable. 1917, it's got written at the bottom. Mm -hmm. He writes letters to his mother from the front saying, I feel like John Clare. I'm, I'm walled in. I'm stuck here. And I'm, I'm gibbering. I'm, I'm, you know, I can't speak. I can't communicate you know, what it is that I want to communicate. Ro Robert and Graves was very worried about right, that. Right, exactly. He said, you know, if you think you're John Clare, you, you know, <laughs> That's right. get treatment. Because he, he, right, you know, right. Uh, <laughs> Robert Graves tended not to mince his words. It's too much. Yeah. <laughs> it's too much. They fell out. But it's a wonderful poem, isn't it? I've never read that aloud before. It's, just, it's lovely oh, to have the chance you. to do it. Thank you. Uh, if this sounds like it's coming and going, this sound, is that, is that troubling people? I, I can't really sense. Right. Um, okay. All right. Where should we go next? Um, I'm not sure what pictures I've got here. What have I got next? Um, oh, that's when he was in, in Japan. I just picked us a selection of random pictures. So when he was writing the memoir, that's on the, the boat he traveled out, I believe. Mm -hmm. I need to pick. What else have we got? Ah. One of the things, yes, I, I'll talk about this anyway, even though you haven't asked me. Okay. <laughs> but one of the things he, he liked to do was annotate books. And having looked at the, the uh, collection upstairs, so many of his books in the collection, thank you, the, the, there's annotations. Uh, you'd never lend blood to the book because he would annotate it. You, you, it would come back, you know, even expensive first editions, people lent him, they'd come back and say, I believe this is slightly inaccurate or something like this. Uh, but his own... Any, if anybody had a copy of um, Undertones, he would annotate it for them. He'd do little pictures and comments. So this is just an example of, of one he annotated for his friend at the front, James Castle, one of many, many friends, uh, one of many, many figures in Undertones. So anyway. Thinking about books mm. and the material sort of object of the book, that is, of course, Ohio University's connection to Edmund Blunden is that we purchased his personal book collection, uh, which by the time he died was 10,000 books um, strong, and many of them rare, you know, 17th through 19th mm. century um, you know, books in British literary history and, and culture, and, and this is a theme that runs through undertones. It's, I'm wondering if you could talk about, you've talked, we've talked a bit about the literary illusions in the book, but just the material artifact of the book itself and what that meant to Blunden and his, his marginalia. Yeah, they're absolutely charming, this voice that emerges, you know, from these, these, these margins in his book. So do you yeah. something just fell down there? I think it's probably my microphone. Uh, so you want me to talk about the actual... I want you to, yes. Books and what did books, oh, mean books mean right. to Blunden? As I said, object, yeah. yeah, he was a mm -hmm. book collector. Mm -hmm. uh, he used to go to down the Farringdon Road, which is now just all offices in London, uh, in the days when there were book barrows there. But he prided himself on on being able to uh, to buy the the most valuable editions for for just sixpence. In fact, he, n he never liked to pay more than sixpence. Mm -hmm. I think it increased it a bit as, as time went on. But uh, so all those ten thousand books, they surely weren't all bought for sixpence. Um, <laughs> But he, he, it made him happy. I think it was a kind of reaction. It was a way of not thinking about the, the war, maybe, just to go lose himself in the, the hunt for a particular volume. But, of course, he was interested in the most obscure poets, poets like <coughs> Samuel Rogers, who, who nobody ever reads, as far as I know. And he writes about this. There's a wonderful poem of his. What's it called? 
something about a Victorian, which it, it's written in the voice of an obs of an obs of a forgotten Victorian poet. No, it's written in the voice of the book, that's right. It says, yeah. I am the yeah. poems yeah. of the late Eliza Cook, is the first line. And mm -hmm. it, it tells the story of this, this book and what's happened to it. Um, so many of his poems do refer to books. Right. He loved his books. He, I read somewhere that he used to clean them with shoe polish. Because uh, of all these leather bindings. He loved the bindings. He used to clean them. Um, and the design of books. He was very interested in the design of books. Uh, and, and, but he, he liked to bargain too. Mm. Uh, and he liked to annotate. And so I could have spent hours looking at the, the ones uh, collected here. Mm -hmm. Goodness knows how he found room for them. Um, mm -hmm. I think he fobbed them off on friends when he went abroad. He spent a lot of time abroad, as I said, in Japan, Hong Kong. He, he was in. Um, and I think friends were suddenly asking, oh, can you take these 10,000 books while I'm away, please? Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know how that went down, really. But, uh, the book as artifact was, was, yes, he was concerned about. So I think he must have been, been fascinated to see what happened with Undertones. Undertones was, Undertones went to, it was reprinted eight times in the first, year, or, or maybe in less than I can quite remember. Certainly it was, it was, it sold out on the first day. And it was, it was an incredible hit. Um, and so that must have pleased him. Uh, and I hope it would have pleased him to see the illustrated <laughs> expanded edition uh, as well. Mm. Uh, there's a specific Mer American edition, uh, which is slightly different from, from the British one. And it has one or two pictures, uh, drawings of his in it, uh, which, which aren't in the, the English one. Uh, there's also a Japanese translation, which he annotated really? thoroughly. Mm. Swedish translation, German translation. Mm -hmm. But books were important to him. It was such a proud day when his first proper collection of poetry came out. Can I read you that, that yeah. occasion? Mm. His, his book, Pastorals, there's a copy of it here on display. Uh, his first proper collection. He self-published uh, some poems when he was at um, Christ's Hospital. But his first book was called Pastorals. And he describes it coming out. There's a little picture on, in my edition here. This is 1916, August 1916. One of the things I wanted to do in the new edition was put dates at the top of the page so you knew where you were. Because the chronology is all over the place. Uh, it, it went, because he wrote undertones without any, any of his diaries to hand. So we know this is August 1916. He's just arrived at the front. Northcott is his commanding officer. Uh, as a reference to arches, which are uh, anti-aircraft, not anti-aircraft, um, artillery shells. Um, yeah. I had written and left with a publisher a trifling collection of verses. I'd forgotten about them, but they entered my story again at Givenchy. The scene is bright in my mind's eye. Northcott and his subalterns in their sandbag house in the village line have had tea and are arguing over some frivolous subject as Mr. Asquith's benignity or the effectiveness of our arches, when, with a great noise and abruptness, a shell from our own batteries behind hits the ground before our window and sends a nose cap into our wallpaper. We are still talking about this mishit and others similar when Colonel Harrison appears and surprises us almost as much with a demand for me. I'm wanted at battalion headquarters. A review of my poems has been printed in the Times Literary Supplement. A kind review it was, if ever there was one. And my colonel is overjoyed at having an actual author in his battalion. How rosy he looks. Paternal Northcott pleaded hard. Oh, surely you won't take our young London, sir. Oh, no, he's quite happy here. I, too, when Colonel Harrison had left, appealed to my admirable company commander, saying how sincerely I knew myself unequal to the lordly style of battalion headquarters. But all to no purpose. That book of verse had done its work. And the same evening, I was at dinner in Harrison's presence, afraid of him and everyone else in that high command, and marveling at the fine glass which was in use there, soon to be deposited with regret in some safe village while we went to worse ruins and cruder warfare. Auden said, poetry makes nothing happen, does it? Mm -hmm. uh, this actually got him out of the line into battalion headquarters, but he didn't want to be there. He wanted to be with, with the other guys fighting. Uh, and he wasn't happy at all to be uh, with, with, the, uh, with the top brass. 
It's, uh, he follows his literary career from the trenches. He's asking his mother to be on the lookout for the <coughs> reviews of his books as they're published. You know, he wants to keep track of these things. So um, I don't know, sure, he's not entirely surprised, I don't think, that like his reputation precedes him a bit right. here. But um, there's another lovely passage you were talking, John was talking earlier today, about the kind of book collecting as a kind of therapeutic thing, right? And mm. I think for Blunden, um, you probably don't have it marked, but that scene where he comes upon the, the French farmhouse mm -hmm. and there are these dis these books, the library, the house has been ruined and the, this library has been sort of destroyed and all the books are lying around the threshold, you know, they're all strewn about. And he's so moved by this, this destruction of, of books in particular. He says, I couldn't help myself, I've got to... I've got to grab one and, and you know, bring something, bring them back, you know, to to the battalion library. The sense of like that that's a, a, a recuperative kind of you know healing gesture. Like there's got to be something that I can do in the midst of this hopelessness, and saving the book becomes in part. He used you know, to that for, he yeah. used to complain that all, all you ever found and, and, uh, and were on the shelves uh, with, with the troops was O. Henry, right, <laughs> whose house I visited when I was in Austin yeah. last year. Um, and uh, Spoon River, yeah. the other Spoon River anthology. Right. So, uh, uh, but well, that was 1917 after the Americans arrived. It sounds sounds like it was an American influence. There, mm -hmm. there is that you know, the, he does cover that towards the end when uh, there's a lot of American characters, particularly uh, in the medical staff, because that's what uh, the, the Americans were, were brought in, uh, for, uh, you know, as originally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So back to undertones. Yes. And <laughs> so your edition. Um, <coughs> The relationship between the prose memoir mm. and the and the poems at the back, mm. um, you know, Blunden says in the preliminaries to Undertones, he talks about I have to go over this ground again, right? Compulsively, you know, just always revisiting these scenes. And so the difference, of course, between the prose and and the poetry mm. um, is, is striking. But he felt, you know, he needed them both together in, mm. in Undertones. He did, um, uh, despite some protests, as he put it. Mm. It was obviously there were friends or people in publishing who said, no, you don't really don't want to do this. You don't want to add poetry, just stick to the memoir. But he doggedly kept the poems there. And some of the poems are uh, of profound importance. Let's see what comes up. I think, yes, just before we get on to that, this is the characters we heard mentioned. Worley was his sergeant, and that's the C Colonel Harrison who was so important to him. He called the real heroes of un undertones. So the next one is, I think, an example of one of the most important poems in the Edna book, and that's, which I'm not going to read, but it just, that's an example of his handwritten um, draft of it. Third Eve is a long poem. Third Eve is what in Britain we, Britain we call just Passchendaele, which was a horrific uh, event at the, in 1917, where it was the mud that got you more than anything else. It, the mud just swallowed up whole battalions. Uh, appalling conditions to fight in. So it's passion there is one of those emotional words. Um, but Third Eve is about that. It is a terrific poem, and that's a good example of how the blank verse is just stress-tested to breaking point, mm. really. And that's the sort of modernism trying to get <laughs> to break out, maybe. Uh, but he sticks to the blank verse. Uh, and it's, it's not the easiest poem to grasp. Uh, but I do recommend you just, just read it aloud to yourself because you have to do that with London, really. Well, all poetry should be read aloud, but just read it slowly and suddenly its magic works, I think. Uh, but the, that's perhaps a, a, an easier, a more accessible one about the, um, about the war. Let's which I read Pillbox, yes. um, which is from the same period, uh, from the same uh, time in 1917. And Worley, we just saw a picture of Worley, his mm -hmm. devoted sergeant major, uh, who had been a butcher in Hastings. And uh, he's here. And it's a really story of a, a man who, who dies from fear. Blighty is referred to in this. You, may, you probably don't know the expression. It's. Um, slang for England. So, oh, I wonder if we go back to Blighty. Uh, mm. If you've got a Blighty, what every soldier wanted was a Blighty wound. A Blighty wound was a wound just bad enough to get you sent home. Uh, so, pillbox. 
Just see what's happening, Whirly. Whirly rose around the angled doorway, thrust his nose, and Sergeant Hode went too to snuff the air. Then war brought down his fist and missed the pair. Yet Hode was scratched by a splinter. The blood came and out burst terrors that he'd striven to tame. A good man, Hode, for weeks. I'm blown to bits, he groans, he screams. Come, Bluffer, where's your wits, says Whirly. Bluffer, you've a blighty man. All in the pillbox urged him, here began his freedom. Think of Eastbourne and your dad. The poor man lay at length and brief and mad, flung out his cry of doom. Soon ebbed and dumb, he yielded. Whirly, with a tot of rum and shouting in his face, could not restore him. The ship of Charon over Channel bore him. All marvelled, even on that most deathly day, to see this life so spirited away. It wouldn't be the English Channel that he crossed, but a with a different channel. Um, it's got little subtle touches like that. But, but that is, he could write in that plainer manner. No hint of the pastoral there, really. It's a little dialogue in it. And there are real characters and, and cameos. Um, and it's rhyming cu heroic couplets, but it's heroic couplets which are sort of straining at the leash, really. Um, yeah. um. We've talked about the pastoral mm. and, and, and the sort of tragic. Um, can you talk a little bit about the humor in mm. undertones? This is not generally what Blunden is known for, the sort of the funny one, right? Graves was the funny one, so soon the angry yeah. one, that kind of thing. Um, but it's it's Blunden witty. has his moments, yes. right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and I think that's an important element in, in the book. And it's important in, in the best of, of war literature, really. Again, I think of that marvelous um, film, originally a, a play, Oh, What a Lovely War. Uh, things like Blackadder, I don't know if that ever made it over here. Yes, a few <laughs> nods. Um, satire, Sassoon, bitterly, yeah. he writes bitterly, but there's this humour there, bitter humour. And it's in London too. It's hard to pin down how it works. One of his readers accused him, I think I've got the quote right, of, of being too happy in describing the war, almost like a child with a bag of sweets. Uh, that this, this person turned to him and said it as he was going out to play cricket, actually. It was sort of <laughs> he, he makes a point of that, just perhaps to undermine his confidence. Um, so the humour is, is, is key to it, uh, but it's not, not belly laugh. There is another passage I could read if, uh, sure, with, with yeah. that, that in mind, actually. Uh, this is Eep at Christmas. Um, when the colonel is doing the rounds, if I can find it. Right, yeah, so this is 1917, no, 1916, Christmas. Now, if, see, the trouble is, if you say humour, then you're expecting some big laughs. There's, there's, there's no big laughs, it's just, you know, the, the tone. Now winter, throwing aside his sleep and drowse, came out fierce and determined. First there was a heavy snow, then the blue sky of hard frost. To our pleasure, we were back in a camp in the woods by Elverdinger to celebrate Christmas. The snow was crystal clean, the trees filigreed and golden. It was a place that retained its boorish loneliness, though hundreds were there. Its odd buildings had the suggestion of tenures. Harrison's Christmas was appreciated by his followers, perhaps more than by himself. He held a church parade, and while officiating, Reading a lesson or so was interrupted by the band, which somehow mistook its cue. The colonel is thought to have said, hold your bloody noise on this contretemps, which did not damp the ardour of the congregation, especially at the back part of the room, as they thundered out while shepherds watched. After prayers, we had supper for the rest of the day, and the colonel visited all the then at their Christmas dinner. At each hut, he was required by tradition to perfect the joy of his stalwarts by drinking some specially and cunningly provided liquid, varying with each company, and in a mug. He got round, but it was almost as much as intrepidity could accomplish. <laughs> so it's a sort of mildly uh, humorous. Uh, 
Because it's a survival, in the actual battle scenes, a sort of a re resigned uh, sort of laughter. It's one of the ways that the men survived out there, by, by joking, laughing. I was talking this with some of the students earlier about uh, how important the, the war songs were and how good it is that these songs are now turning up in poetry anthologies and being recognized as a kind of poetry in their own right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Um, I know I, s I blanked on it. I was going to ask you, mm. so you um, have a collection of poetry to mm. the war poets mm. uh, where you've singled out certain uh, World War I uh, poets and you sort of write in, re in response to them and so I want to hear your poem to, um, to Blunden mm. but maybe first just preface it by, by um, talking about what it is that, what did you want to respond to? One poet to another, what was it that sort of, what element of, of Blunden's poetry did you most particularly want to sort of get in dialogue with? And all of this also by pointing out that um, Nick from Little Professor is over here and he has copies of John's um, To the War uh, Poets. And so um, it's just by way of, of establishing yes. that. But yeah. Yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> it does have a commercial, is not it? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, it really, that, that's the whole sequence to the war poets mm. just sort of fell upon me. Uh, and I just found myself wanting to talk to the war poets as you would talk to a fellow poet on Facebook or something. So I saw a series of verse letters and one to Blunder. This was before I knew I was going to be editing Blunder. Um, and I was in Ypres with some students, in fact, and we were visiting the battlefields. I haven't, you haven't really emphasized how important place is to mm. Blunden mm. and to the war poets in general. Locations, if you think about it, war is to do with places and locations. And Blunden is always coming back to particular places, particular names of places. Um, but Ypres, if you go to Ypres, there are Blunden poems scattered around little plaques all, all over the place because he was there. Uh, again, I haven't said this, but Blunden was at so many of the, the big battles of the war. He was at the Somme. He was at, um, and, and he was at Passchendaele. He was at uh, all these uh, desperate places. And so you can't go to Ypres without thinking of Blunden. And I just wanted to say something to him ab about that. And it, I see it, it could be perceived as presumptuous. His daughter seemed happy with it, which pleased me. Um, it's fairly presumptuous to be reading one of my poems, when I, but it, it is to Edmund Blunden, Ypres. Dear Blunden, here's a pastoral you'll appreciate. Uncensored too, though I'm running out of pencil and don't know what the Flemish is for sharpener. It's Broidelesque, the Isa Canal. One angler with two rods and an unnecessary mud-brown brolly. A bell is tolling midday and beyond behind me and birdsong all around. One magpie, two carrion crows, a far cry from the throng back in the Flanders Fields Museum. The tin helmet over the litter bin swings in the breeze beside my metal bench. There are cyclists, and a lady's terrier snaps and growls at someone's knapsack. It is all unimaginable. The great deceit of spring. Shout, April fool, Ypres rubble, the dead unburied, the wars going on still. I cough and cough, but not because there's gas. I read that once, there was a Flemish woman in the audience. She told me what the Flemish for, um, <laughs> for, for pencil sharpener was. I still can't remember it. But. Um, I'm struck by that in, in Blunden's letters, his biography, he revisits the battlefields, right, almost annually, it seems, oh, yes, just yes, all yes. the time. And then eventually he's serving on the uh, Imperial War Graves Commission. So it's part of his work there is that dedication to memorializing, but again, revisiting, retreading that same ground. And then at some point, almost um, sorry that the landscape has changed so much, right, as the years pass and the land is sort of healing and it's bearing its scars, you know, less and, and less. Um, he's almost sad for that or he can't find those spots where he once was or they look so different and there's that sort of poignancy that I find so 
interesting and yeah, yes, the obsessively that right. haunting you talked about. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. being drawn to to, to you know, the genus loci. I'm being drawn right. to, to place, uh, and uh, that was true of, of, of many locations. But going back east and trying to puzzle your way around and find what happened where. There's poems about that. There's there's one called. So uncertainty in the battlefield, I think it's called something like that. But that whole uncertainty, when you read undertones, if you read undertones, and many of you perhaps have, but do read undertones, you may well feel a similar sense of bafflement as you read it. One of the, the things I wanted to do in editing it was yeah. to, to be a kind of battlefield guide because it is, it's <laughs> Blunder described it as a deranged chronology, I think that was his phrase. Um, <laughs> Because My students are reading it right now, so uh, right. they can well, appreciate the challenges of, of right. It, there yeah. he was in <laughs> Tokyo. There had just been an earthquake. Uh, Tokyo was devastated. There were aftershocks, and they reminded him of, of the battle. Uh, he didn't have anything with him except a couple of maps, examples of which you can see here in the exhibition. Um, none of his diaries are just... Very few of his notes. So it was done from this extraordinarily powerful memory. If you read the book and you think that was all done from memory, it is amazing. Um, so it is a kind of phantasmagoria, really. And I think that's what turns it into a kind of prose poem. And you think you have to approach it like that. And that's what makes it, why it's still with us and still in print, uh, you know, 90 years on. Um, so that is part of its importance, really, and part of its magic. The fact that you never quite know where you are. Now, perhaps I've spoiled that by putting at the head of each <laughs> page where we seem to be, but and give, providing an index and things like that. But it, it is interesting to know where these places are. When he did get back to his notes, <coughs> and there was another edition in 1930, he did add a few more place names. Um, but he names people and he names places because he wanted to honour them. He said the book always was an elegy. It's a memorial, just like the famous Teepval Memorial. His book was a memorial to those men who died. And he always felt he was writing it for them, for the veterans. He says in his first introduction that, that people who weren't at the front won't understand the book. Mm -hmm. He was wrong, because it sold out on the first day, and many bought it, and many understood it. And he says that in the introduction to the second uh, edition. Many have understood it. Uh, and I think that surprised him, actually, that it found a popular readership, because he always felt it was writing for the men, and it, it was men, chiefly. There's very few women pass through its pages, though women are very important in London's own life. Um, and I think, uh, I've lost my thread there, but anyway, I think mm. I say what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've talked a bit about right the reputation mm. of undertones of war not being out of print since 28. Mm. How do you think um, sort of in, in uh, how do you think his reputation has has fared? Uh, you know uh, subsequently because you know his book as you mentioned comes out when there's a, a sort of flurry of writing about the First World mm. War and the late from 28 to, to 30, you know, mm. with Graves and Sassoon's memoirs and so forth. And, and so what do you think London sort of subsequently uh, kind of contributes uh, that's different? Well, he, uh, there were many editions, uh, different editions as, as the years went on. His reputation, though, it went down because he was against war. And mm -hmm. that was fine, you know, after the war, okay. War to end wars, they called the First World War. But then Hitler came along, and, you know, uh, London became associated with uh, the appeasement movement and, and wanted to stop war at all costs. And that, you know, that, uh, you can understand that that, was, uh, that caused a lot of difficulties. And he spoke at peace rallies and that kind of thing. And there was quite a bit of hostility towards him. That's one of the reasons I think he went to, mm -hmm. to Hong Kong uh, and lived there for quite a long time. And his reputation dwindled, but then he came back again. He, he was all over the newspapers in the 19th, uh, 1960s when he was up against Robert Lowell for the Oxford Professorship of Poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he won. Uh, he de defeated Lowell. The, the headline in the New Statesman was, Someone Has Blundered. Um, <laughs> it, was, it came at an awkward time because he was a very sick man and it was an embarrassing fiasco. He his lectures, he would be wearing a mortarboard and he put his mortarboard down and he'd 
put his notes in the mortar, in the mortar board, and he put the mortar board on his head with the notes in. And he was he was all over the place. It was just an embarrassing thing. He shouldn't he shouldn't have got had it with really. him. Um, but he so he drifted away from from people. Incidentally, one of the, one of the reasons he won was because um, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton were in town when the elections were happening for the Oxford Professor of Poetry, and they endorsed him. So he had the endorsement of Liz Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> that um, but his reputation. But he's coming back again. Um, one or two anthologies recently mm-hmm. have put him up front and centre. Um, Tim Kendall's uh, Oxford edition of Poetry of the First World War, terrific anthology. There's a lot of blunder in it. So perhaps he's never gone away, really. But he does require that extra bit of work. And at a first reading, you might think, oh, this is old-fashioned. But then I also use the analogy of Bach. J.S. Bach writes very old-fashioned music. In his time, J.S. Bach was writing in a very old-fashioned way. But that doesn't, you know, doesn't, you don't notice that now. So I think it will not matter in years to come. Edmund Spencer was writing in a very old-fashioned way, uh, you know, the Elizabethan poet. Uh, but it doesn't really matter now. So the more time passes, I think the less it matters that he was using an archaic style. Mm-hmm. It's a sort of paradox. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, so bear with Unfairs War, those of you that are struggling through it. Um, I'd be interested perhaps to hear somebody wha- from somebody what you think about it. Can you talk a little bit about his friendship with Siegfried Sassoon? Yes, it was a, a very important friendship. Um, I think it was his first uh, collection, The Wagoner, again, it's a copy of the first edition upstairs, um, was sent to Sassoon for review, and he was struck by the poems, and particularly one called The Barn, I think, struck it, and he wanted to meet Blunder. And he introduced Blunder into literary society. It was really Sassoon, uh, Sassoon knew everyone. Uh, and so that became very important to them. And cricket was the other thing. Blunder was mad on cricket. He wrote a book about cricket. I won't try. I, I don't know how much you know about cricket. I won't try and explain. <laughs> Can you explain ro- cricket? No. <laughs> <laughs> but he wrote. I don't understand. It. <laughs> there's a poem um, uh, that answers that question by Blunder called "Cricket, I Confess," where uh, you know, someone said to him, uh, "I admire your work, Mr. Blunder, and I admire English culture, but cricket, I confess, I don't understand." Uh, and it's a kind of response to that. A cricket was very important. It's a kind of, it's the battlefield tactics uh, that I think interested him. Yeah. Uh, and Sassoon was, was fond of cricket. And I think, yeah, very, what a, what a system yeah. here. We have a picture somewhere yeah. of Blunden in old age sitting with Siegfried Sassoon, listening, listening to uh, what we call a test match on the radio. And sometime in the 1960s, a wireless, this is at Siegfried Sassoon's house, um, which I think is a rather wonderful mm. picture. The guy on the right, who I've cut out, rather sadly, it's called Dennis Silk, who was a cricketer, and he actually attended the launch of this, um, of, of my edition, which, which was oh, an amazing link with mm-hmm. the past. In fact, there were various people turned up at the launch. A, dis- a descendant of John Clare turned, turned up there, and various relations of, of London. So you suddenly feel yourself thrown back in time. Mm. Um, yes. um, one of London's poems, it's, it wasn't published in undertones, but it has an extraordinary kind of critical reputation as the uh, report on experience. Mm. Um, and I was wondering if you could mm. read that. Are, are we approaching ending time? Is this I a don't closing know. poem? Is this a know. closing? Um, it makes a good closing poem. It does make a good closing poem. Well, I thought we could take questions as oh, well. Oh, that's a good idea, yes. Yeah. Let's just so get a picture to go first? with it. Uh, this seems an appropriate. Pl- oh, right, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. him on one of his yeah, battlefield visits that we talked about. Mm-hmm. And that's his gravestone, uh, Long Melford, a beautiful village, um, not far from where it is. Something just fell down. <laughs> the ghost of Mr. Blunt. Microphone. Te- all kinds of interesting things happening here. A technical expert arrives. <laughs> a very appropriate title: this report on experience. Report on my experience from the microphone. Uh, this poem, what fascinates me about this poem, apart from the fact that it's, it's been called his best poem, uh, this little note you have here, um, it was, he said he almost threw it away. He almost discarded it. He thought nothing of it. And that's, that, that strikes me as a lesson to all of us, really. Just, just never assume that uh, it's the poems that you think are going to survive are going to survive. 
Thank goodness he didn't throw it away. Report on experience. I have been young, and now I'm not too old. And I have seen the righteous forsaken, his health, his honor, and his quality taken. This is not what we were formerly told. I have seen a green country, useful to the race, knocked silly with guns and mines, its villages vanished, even the last rat and last kestrel banished. God bless us all. This was peculiar grace. I knew Serafina. Nature gave her hue, glance, sympathy, note, like one from Eden. I saw her smile warp, heard her lyric deaden. She turned to harlotry. This I took to be new. Say what you will, our God sees how they run. These disillusions are his curious proving that he loves humanity and will go on loving. Over there are faith, life, virtue in the sun. Report of experience. And that's from, um, this is actually reading from, again, an original edition. This is not an actual first edition, but it was the second impression, so the same month as the first edition. Um, it's 1929. Even sort of got the rough cut pages, which are rather nice. Um, well, so in 1929, he's not an old man. But he, you know, very early, he just starts to describe himself as someone so sort of weary and, yeah. and, and old, you know, old before his time. Yeah. And, and he, uh, undertones have just been published mm -hmm. when this came out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that. Anyone have some questions for John? Any thoughts or anything more you'd like to know about? Or Deepa Nicole, who knows you just as much as I do about this. I've read, I've lived in this world, right? Well, yeah. That's a great That's a question. question. I think what it was, if, if you'd mentioned any place names, they would have been crossed out because th that's what they were particularly sensitive about. Actually, one of Blum's jobs was to do that for other, other people sometimes. So maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but not many of the poems did survive. And I think if they were going to survive, they would have you would have had to take them home yourself. He said that most of his poems were lost in the blood, in, in the mud of Passchendaele. Uh, so that that's... I, so he probably... If they did get home in the mail, it was you were lucky. I, I doubt it somehow. They would have been redacted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Scott, yeah. Of course you don't. Right, yeah, yeah. Do you want to repeat the question? Oh, oh right. <laughs> well, so, of course, <laughs> right. Repeat the question. So, the uniqueness of the fact that there's so much British uh, poetry uh, coming out of the First World War, the Americans don't seem to have um, the equivalent. And, you know, do we have a similar phenomenon uh, with Italian uh, combatants or, uh, or German, perhaps, mm. uh, French? Um, Has it happened? I mean, just, just about the Americans. I've just, just had a book to review. Um, about American poetry in the First World War, and, uh, which, which tells me, and I didn't know this, that at least 400 volumes of poetry about the First World War were published, uh, and many, many epic poems. So that was news to me. Uh, but Alan Seeger is the one that, that we, do, we do remember. Um, but uh, French and Italian, uh, there was the memoir by Bob Barbus, uh, which, okay. which uh, is, is very important, and, and, very, and got quite heavily criticized at the time because it was so brutal and so uh, honest. Italian I honestly don't know about. Germans I do because there were, uh, uh, I've translated a few of them from into the war poets, in fact. Trachel, the Austrian, uh, who, who was killed in the war and uh, uh, had a dreadful time out there. Georg Heim, before the war, but wrote about it. 
uh, and Strahm and one or two others. So, so again, they've been rather airbrushed out of the history. Mm. Italians I simply don't know about. Uh, but you're absolutely right. The, 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 uh, it's a particularly English thing. I say English rather than Scottish, even Welsh. It, it's, it's an English thing um, that, uh, that these war poets cluster together in the way that tends to happen in literature. You get these little movements where things happen, as it happened with the, with the late poets, the romantics. You get these little groups of poets. Uh, but this, it was a traumatic experience. And um, to a certain extent, I think it's true of the Vietnam uh, poets here. There are quite, quite a few poets that, that, that one could say that of. Um, but I, I mean, let's find out about the Italians. I really don't know about them. Mm. Perhaps you do. I don't know. No, no. I mean, I'm thinking of All Quiet on the Western Front, right? So the yes, German, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, and that's also, you know, 10 years later, 1928, and it yeah. kind of sets off that kind of the disillusionment school, right? Yes. That particular account of the war is one that's, that's um, you know, much more, more cynical and, and, and yeah. bitter, right? As opposed to the more patriotic stuff that was what was early. And it's a novel, yeah. too, isn't it? We're and that's a novel, yeah. so yeah. not poetry, but yeah. thinking about the German yeah. experience that yeah. the British, you know, writers were all reading, mm. uh, remark, yeah. Mm. So. Well, did everyone Nicole, hear that? Yeah. I, I don't think he came to America. I, I, I don't I think right. so. I don't see any reference to that in the in the biography. Let me repeat the question. So, uh, <laughs> did did Blunden ever come to America, and how did OU get get those ten thousand? Well, books? you can answer that one. I can you? answer the yeah. So, not sure about America. Don't think so. But. Um, he was aware of the big American institutions that were actively buying, um, you know, letters from of contemporary uh, British. You know, he knew that that the Ransom Center at UT Austin had purchased Sassoon's, and so you know, Blunden, you know, saw an early he oversaw an early sort of sale of some of his stuff. Um, so he was aware that there was interest in big American archives and universities in this material. Um, in terms of his books, right. So some of you know this uh, story. It has to do with um, an English professor here at Ohio University who was a Percy Shelley scholar who had been in correspondence with Edmund Blunden about Percy Shelley, about this romantic he wrote poet. A, a wonderful biography of Shelley. Right, it? yeah, right. Blunden wrote a biography of, of mm. Shelley. I didn't know that he thought Shelley had haunted him, but mm. that's perfect. Um, <laughs> but anyway, through this correspondence with Neville Rogers, this English professor here at OU, uh, I think it was uh, Rogers who knew that Blunden had passed away, that there was this enormous book collection that was really uh, to the point of being burdensome, right, for a family. I mean, this, this storage and maintenance of this collection really through the decades was, was a constant sort of point of, of concern for Blunden. He writes about it a lot, and he has to beg people to look after his books for him, and they're just the weight of the books and the buildings and, you know, what they were going to do to the floors and all this stuff. Anyhow, so I think through that there was this awareness that there, uh, the collection was available. And 1982, um, right? I think uh, Neville Rogers brought the proposal to the library, and the funds uh, were secured. We have this correspondence that's fascinating. They they packed up the books in England and shipped them, you know, on a on a, on a boat, <laughs> and uh, and they came here. And by the time they got here, there was some discrepancy. Originally, there was supposed to be X numbers of thousands, and when the librarians here started counting, we were missing a few thousand. And then there's some correspondence back and forth about that, you know, and. Uh, but they sorted it out, and, and Claire Blunden says, I'll send you others. Here's some more. I've still got more, you know. And uh, Yeah, so. Um, Claire, Claire Blunden was his third wife. Yes, and right. She's and 22 uh, years younger. Yeah. And so that's it. And they're here. They're so they're of extraordinary value because so many of them are these old, uh, you know, rare, unique. They're association copies. They're made more valuable by the fact that well, here's a 17th century edition of you know a, an English translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis, and it's a gift from Siegfried Sassoon to Edmund Blunden, and it's inscribed, and he gave it to Blunden uh, when Blunden got his honorary degree. Uh, from Oxford, because Blunden originally had to leave um, Oxford without taking his degree. So th those kinds of associations, I mean, the book itself is, of course, of extraordinary value, but then this added value because of that. Um, the, the annotations so are, that, that are what was funny. Yeah, I, I was particularly yeah. interested in seeing his copies of King Lear, because King Lear uh, was one of the, the books that he returned to again and again when mm -hmm. he was in Japan, and while he was writing undertones, he read it through on the boat out to Japan. So I was particularly interested to see those copies. Uh, I was wondering whether he had, he had the actual copy he had with him in Japan, but oh we decided wow. it probably wasn't that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, 
but to, uh, one could spend many hours in that uh, collection. Mm -hmm. So it's a privilege to have come here and seen it, actually. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us more about his personal life? He was married at least three times. Uh, <laughs> right. So now I'm more curious. Uh, yeah. uh, How long have you got? Um, more about London's personal life. Yeah, I think what I can remember. Yeah. I mean, he married... Um, he may even have been before the war ended because he was yes, he sort it of was yes he did he, he yeah. was because he was worn out he was in so long at the front so he kept finding excuses not to send him back and he kept longing to go back and in, in the interim he got married to Mary Dane so that was the first marriage very very sort of local girl uh, sort of conformed to all his ideals of country life and the peasantry or whatever he would write about and he they lived happily in Suffolk a simple life but then things turned out they had children. Now, I haven't mentioned this is very important. Their first child, mm -hmm. Joy, died at the age of five weeks from contaminated milk powder. And he never got over that. I mean, the, all the grief of the war, the grief of losing that child, he wrote about it a lot, that haunts him again. Yeah. Uh, and he, he comes back to that again and again. And I think it was sort of downhill from there with the marriage. They had two more children called John and Claire, of course. Um, <laughs> and I think one of whom, or descent of one of whom was at the launch again. I can't quite remember. So there was that. And then that fell apart while he was in Japan. He had an affair with Aki Hayashi when he was in Japan, a uh, student teacher. Uh, and she <laughs> wanted him to marry her. She made him sign a document saying, I hereby undertake that if I do ever marry, I will not marry anyone other than Aki Hayashi. Bizarre thing to do. Um, so th that was a, sort of a fair while. He was still married to, to Mary. Went back from Japan. It all, the marriage fell apart. And he met Silva Norman, who was a fiction writer. Of, no, she was Armenian. Maybe Armenian-American. I can't quite remember. I think, mm. I think it may be. Um, but sh they wrote a novel together, which I saw a copy of in the library here for the first time I've seen it. We'll shift our ground. I think it's a pretty awful book. Yeah, um, uh, uh, and the marriage, it was a sort of literary marriage. Didn't last long. Things He was suffering depressions, and it, 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 he married her, but it fell apart by mutual agreement. And then, when he was at Merton College, Oxford, where he spent a lot of his life, he was on a time century supplement, but then 13 years at Merton, uh, he met, uh, he was a student actually, um, Claire Pointing, 22 years his junior, and everybody said, well, you know, he should have married her in the first place. That was, uh, was a, and, and they stayed together forever thereafter, had four daughters. And uh, what have I missed out of his personal life? But that's it, that's it in short, the, 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 the marriages. But he was troubled for many years. He was a drinker. That's something I haven't mentioned. Uh, I suppose he was an alcoholic. He fell out with, uh, with Robert Graves over that. Graves, being Graves, he confronted him on the matter and said you, you should, shouldn't resort so much to, to the bottle. Mm -hmm. And they didn't speak for some years. Um, <laughs> but they didn't speak for even longer after the business well world. Do you want to say something about that? Liz? Goodbye no. to all that. Yeah. Right. So Graves' version of the war and goodbye to all that is um, 29, mm. the year after Blunden's undertones of war, and where Blunden is the pest in the pastoral vein and with some of his archaic kind of expressions and a kind of mild humor, but not really, you know, Graves is much more, we were talking about this last night with Jill, much more sort of, uh, right, I guess, satirical. And, and, and kind of brash, I mean, goodbye to all that, right? Where Blunden is undertones of war. You can sort of <laughs> see where that, goodbye to all that. And he's writing his, it's a sort of Bildungsroman and, and also a, a war memoir. And he's just sort of putting it all in his, in his past. And Blunden and Sassoon were um, outraged at, at Graves' account. Blunden had received an advanced copy, an advanced copy of the book to review because they assumed Blunden would review it favorably because he's good friends with Graves and Blunden is horrified. And, and oh, Gr Graves suggested that Wilfred Owen had been a coward, had behaved cowardly, right? You, right, exactly. <laughs> it's like, that's like, no, 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 you don't do that. And then they had, the, it had these passages where uh, Graves remembered visiting 
grieving Siegfried Sassoon's family and Siegfried Sassoon's mother, who was grieving the loss of her oldest, right, Sassoon's brother. And so Graves writes about this, and, and Sassoon was outraged at, you know, at Graves' depiction of, of his mother. And so Sassoon demanded from Cape, you know, the publisher, he said, you must take these passages out. And, and Graves had also published in the text uh, a, a copy of a poem that Sassoon had sent to him that Sassoon hadn't published yet. And so Graves reproduces this, right, without... Trade to, to Robert Lowe. Right, right <laughs> yeah, and, and so, and, and they did, and so Cape had already printed a whole a bunch of these, but he, um, so, uh, so there's, there's sort of two first editions. There's the very first one with the offending passages, and then there's another one where they just basically removed, you know, the type and put in some asterisks mm. um, so that they could Collector's yeah. item, I should think. Yeah. yeah, and then um, they extracted even further revenge. I could talk about this too much, but um, uh, so they each had Sassoon and Graves, each had their own, co I mean, Sassoon and Blunden each had their own copies of Goodbye to All That, these advanced copies, and they uh, annotated them furiously. They vented their anger, and, and, and Blunden's plan was to take his copy with all of these angry marginal About 400 notes. annotations. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah and put it in the British Museum, in the yeah. British Museum, <laughs> right, and that for, for posterity, the whole world would know, right, you know, what Graves did. Um, and they eventually, right, it didn't make it there, um, you know, they, they, they calmed down a bit, and Sassoon, it, it was in Sassoon's library, that's where it ended up. Um, so, yeah, so the falling out with Robert Graves uh, was really uh, severe, but it was about, so it's about some personal things as well, yeah, but it's yeah. about who gets to tell the story of the war, right, and in what way. That's and and, and Sassoon and, and Blunden felt so strongly that Graves had gone about it in the wrong way. Um, I mean, he fell out with Sassoon as well briefly, that over, I think, the, uh, yeah, because um, Sassoon felt he was getting too close to his wife, I think, at one point. Yeah. There was a brief estrangement from Sassoon, but mm. not for long, not for long. Mm. I mean, there are three fat, fat, fat volumes of, maybe four volumes of, of the letters, Sassoon right. and yeah. Blunden. Right. Blunden wrote so much, unstoppable. All with a steel dip pen. Mm. Up till the 1970s, he used a mm. dip pen. And then is it true he didn't care for the phone? So oh, really? I didn't know I that. don't know. So there's still a lot of letters, even even well into, you know, a point he where... believed in the, in the, the written word. Right, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and how he would have got on with Twitter and so on. <laughs> <laughs> I think Robert Graves would have loved Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is there somebody with you? I don't know what to say to that mm, because uh, it, you're t it's such <coughs> dangerous ground to tread on, isn't it? Um, I wouldn't, ev I wouldn't even dare mm. take on such such, such, such a program. But great to to, sh to share the poems with those veterans, and I would take it from all through them, really, what 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 they want to follow up. Things if you start talking about the technicalities of the language and the intricacies of rhyme and line breaks, it all seems a bit irrelevant. Which is always the, the thing about war poetry, but it seems sort of. Uh, it's, it's obscene to start to worry about uh, poetry. Wilfred Owen, in his famous preface to his, his poem, said, above all, I'm not concerned with poetry, capital P. He didn't, he's a really confronting that issue, that once you start talking about poetry, it's, it takes away from what you've been through. And if you've actually been through something as those veterans would have been, um, it, it, it's hard. So the fact that Blunden had been through so much and lived through so much would presumably gain the respect of such readers. Um, because to be a non-combatant war poet is tricky. There's a poet called Wilfred Gibson who wrote some wonderful war poetry, but he never set foot <laughs> in France. It, it was all done through his imagination. So for many years, he wasn't seen as somehow legitimate. But he's coming back because they're actually good poems. But um, 
just take it from them, I would say. That, that would be my approach. Um, but I, I, I could certainly tell you which poems might work better than others, but perhaps not in the public forum, I do think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think, okay. Um, John Greening will be giving a uh, reading of his own poetry uh, tomorrow at 4.30 in Baker Center, room 341. And so I encourage you all to come and hear more of John's conversation uh, with the war poets. Um, we have some, some copies of London's Undertones of War. Um, unfortunately, this beautiful, I, I mean, it's an amazing edition with the, the, the explanatory texts and it's been so helpful um, for me to use as I try to teach this with um, my, my students. But um, this is not available. This Oxford University Press edition is not available in the United States. Unless so you're very coming. Unless you're, right, you go on Amazon and use the, you know, use. Or as an e-book, I think it may be available. Right, yeah. Um, but in lieu of that, we do have little professor here who has some of the Chicago University Press uh, paperback editions of Undertones. And so if you are curious to, to read it, and I, I hope you, yeah, do give it a try, right? It's worth the challenges. Absolutely. Um, uh, over here with Nick from Little Professor and copies of John's book as well. Um, and so if you could all thank me, uh, not thank me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I meant to say, join me in thanking our guests. <laughs> wow, I don't even want to go there. Thank you, John Greening. Thank you. Thank you.